All set? All righty. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the, uh, the first Manchester blockchain meetup. I'm Ted Henry. Um, I work here at SNU. I don't work in this um, wonderful space, but I work over at the Mill Yard. I'm a project manager on the web team. Um, and uh, like many of you, I just got very interested in blockchain technology um, and uh, wanted to start a place where we could all get together and talk about it and see what's happening here in the Manchester area. I know there's a, a lot going on over in the coast, um, a lot going on down in Boston. Been to a bunch of uh, meetups down there. It takes me two and a half hours to get there. So I uh, thought um, it might be a good idea to find group of people who want to explore these uh, topics together much closer to home. Um, I want to thank uh, SNU for uh, allowing us to use the uh, sandbox space, this wonderful space, uh, to meet up um, tonight. Uh, this is a great facility, um, as you can see. Um, I think some of you might have already discovered the kitchen and the bathrooms are right behind it, just to take care of that bit of housekeeping. Um, Steve and Shay are helping us to live stream tonight. I'd like to thank them. Uh, and finally, I'd just like to introduce our speaker. So uh, Scott Overmeyer is the Assistant Executive Director for STEM here at SNU. And tonight, he's going to talk to us about establishing a credentialing ecosystem with blockchain. Please help me welcome Scott. Thank you. I'm making all sorts of assumptions about everyone's existing knowledge of blockchain. Um, if there are people who have absolutely no knowledge of blockchain, you'll be pretty comfortable here. If you have uh, uh, intimate knowledge of the mathematics behind the algorithms that drive blockchain, then you might be a little bit sleepy. Um, but uh, I'll try to have something for everybody. Scott, I think your microphone's not turned back on. Oh. How's that? Okay. So, uh, wherefore out there on blockchain? And why do we have this wonderful technology, this device that uh, we haven't apparently had heretofore, except the, everybody knows that ledgers have been around for a little while, and uh, encrypted ledgers have been around for a little while as well. But this is kind of a new look at that kind of technology, and I think it works pretty well. So, uh, Dilbert says, uh, yeah, I'm in marketing. Can you explain in terms that I can understand? She says, I kind of doubt it because you're a bad explainer, right? Yeah, it's probably uh, the case with me as well, but we'll see how that works out. Um, so blockchain per se is a distributed ledger. It, uh, it keeps track of things, okay? And it keeps track of things by chaining blocks together of transactions. And uh, so every copy of a blockchain is a complete copy. So everybody has a copy of the blockchain and everybody can examine the blockchain. Now you can't uh, always figure out what the blockchain means, but you can examine the transactions and the blocks that are on the blockchain and you can figure out uh, who, who established them and where the next chain, next block is linked to and so forth. So there's some things you can do, some things you can't do. So uh, there are also in, in terms of uh, protections for linking the blockchain together, you have a public and, and private key system. And uh, so if you want to send somebody something on the blockchain, like Bitcoin, for example, you need to have their public key. And if you have something like this, which you may be able to see and you may not. Something like BitPay, um, you, uh, you have your private key and your public key embedded in this particular uh, device in the software. And if you want to send somebody something, you generate a public key, which can be then sent and you know uh, generate from the sender their public key as well so you know where something came from and where it's going to, and uh, that links it all together. 
if you want to write a transaction to the blockchain, you also need the private key. But again, that's private and we hold that and keep that to ourselves. We don't allow that to be public. So uh, here's a sample blockchain with a few blocks. You may have seen this diagram before. You have a hash, which is a calculation, a cryptographic calculation. Uh, by the way, this is not cryptography that's used in the blockchain. A hash is simply a translation. It only goes one way. So you can't take the hash and go back the other way and figure out what it means. You can only take the hash and figure out whether it matches something that you already know about. So here's a previous block hash, uh, and obviously this points to the previous block. Again, previous block hash that points to this one and so forth and so long, so on. And then transactions, which also have hashes associated with them, which are in the block. And that's how we can tell whether or not these transactions are valid because <clears throat> we go through a procedure to try and reach a consensus when somebody tries to add something to the block. So my main concern in all this is looking at the educational applications of this. And so I'll start talking about that in just a minute. But still, there are some things that I'd like to proceed with. For example, let's say SNU wants to send a digital certificate to somebody, to a student. So uh, this transaction is then represented online as a block to be added. And these transactions gather um, with a educational blockchain, private or public. Um, it doesn't necessarily meet this 10 minute criteria like you come across with Bitcoin. But uh, every block is broadcast to every party that's on the network. And then the people on the network try to come to some kind of a consensus as to whether this is a correct transaction which belongs, or a correct block which belongs uh, in the blockchain. Only when there is a consensus that the block should be added to the chain does this actually happen. So then when the block is, uh, when there's a consensus, the block is added to the chain. And then the digital asset uh, is then the property of uh, whoever it's sent to. Um, so this property, uh, this uh, process of consensus building in a blockchain is very important for security and uh, for um, a number of uh, other reasons. When we talk about the social value proposition of, uh, of blockchain technology, I'll list a number of those things that are important and uh, why the blockchain is a little bit unique when representing these types of transactions. So, like I mentioned, <clears throat> blocks are validated by a consensus decision, and there are four main methods of obtaining a consensus. So there's the PBFT, Practical Byzantine Fault Tolerance Algorithm. There's proof of work, there's proof of stake, and there's delegated proof of stake. Uh, I'll, I'll go through all these briefly, but um, the one that Bitcoin uses, for example, uh, is proof of work. Um, a problem with proof of work, of course, is it uses a lot of electricity to process. It's very expensive. And so you have to have uh, some way of providing uh, enough electricity at a reasonable cost so that when you're mining Bitcoins, and the act of mining is part of this consensus building process that I just mentioned. Um, when you're doing that, you need to expend less energy and less resources than you expect to gain. And, and right now, the, uh, I think the, the uh, Bitcoin uh, rate for mining is, if you solve the puzzle first, is like 12.5 Bitcoins, which is $120,000, $130,000 at current exchange rates. So uh, you have to be pretty economical with your electricity. Now, this brings a worry to some people that um, are looking at cryptocurrencies, for example, because China has a very cheap source of, of uh, electricity. And so that could be a problem looking at uh, very cheap sources of electricity. I, for example, I have 20 acres in South Dakota I could cover with solar panels if I could afford it and probably do quite well in Bitcoin mining, uh, having the devices and basically free power. But that's beside the point, I digress. So um, 
This is the, uh, a look at the practical Byzantine fault tolerance algorithm. <clears throat> the Byzantine general's problem is kind of an interesting one. You have two armies, right? And the two armies are going to fight over the city, B. And so the only way that you can actually take the city is if you cooperate. So both armies have to attack at the same time or else the city with its defenses will defeat either one of the armies separately. <clears throat> this is a, a famous problem in computer science and it's been around for a long time. And um, the reason that it's called practical is because the problem is nearly intractable unless you add some caveats to it and make it a little bit easier. But uh, so each general maintains this internal state that is what's going on, I'm going to attack at uh, 5 a.m., right? When the general receives a message, they use that message in conjunction with all the internal state that they have to try and run a computation, all right? And this computation will tell them whether the message is genuine or not because if I send a message from here to here and it goes through the city, my messenger may be intercepted and I might have somebody else create an interesting message that says, yeah, Army A1 is going to attack at a leisurely hour, 9, 9 a.m., when actually the truth is they're going to attack at dawn. So we have to make sure that, um, that these messages work together. So the general makes a decision as to whether it, uh, it's, the message is genuine, and <laughs> when he reaches his decision, he transmits it to the rest of the network for consensus building, okay? If you make a consensus that the message is real, then you can go ahead and launch the attack if there is a sufficient consensus that, um, in fact, the message is genuine. And this algorithm is translated roughly into one way to build consensus about whether transactions on a block are genuine or not. Is this used a lot? Mm -hmm. Some, but I don't know too many vendors who are way out there with, uh, with uh, Byzantine fault tolerance. Proof of work is much more common. Proof of work is the, the way that most people know how Bitcoin consensus is reached. The proof of work is that when you're trying to decide whether or not a, a, a new block belongs on the blockchain, you um, have to solve these very complex puzzles, which are basically figuring out from a hash uh, of the message plus the hash of the last block um, whether or not the message is genuine. And the way you do this is by guessing, basically. So you might start with the hash plus you add a one and you try that and you compute that. And if that works, great, but it usually doesn't. So you try it with a two and you compute that. And if that works and so on and so forth, millions, literally millions of times until you come up with the right answer. Okay. So <clears throat> whoever publicly verifies the information first is rewarded for that quick computing. And the process of searching for these hashes is known as mining, Bitcoin mining in this particular case. And like I said, you guess the original number, you win if you do it first. Uh, devices to do uh, mining in Bitcoin on the blockchain range from, I don't know, about 800 bucks to thousands. And uh, they're specialized computing devices that do draw a lot of power but they have a lot of computing power and <laughs> miners sit there and churn away playing these guessing games until they get the right answer. Um, <clears throat> so this incentivized participation uh, works out when you get to a 51% consensus. So 51% of the network says that you're good, you're good. Um, this brings up a kind of a problem as well because if you have enough computing power and if you have a conglomerate of miners that makes up 51% of the network, then you can kind of centralize what's going on with mining and capitalize on that in terms of mining Bitcoins. Um, people that participate in 
in uh, bitcoins and a uh, blockchain on this level uh, are sensitive to that to the point where a couple of years ago this happened where one of the conglomerates, one of the ant conglomerates, um, got to close to 50% and some of the members of that particular conglomerate voluntarily joined other ones so they would stay uh, below 50% because it jeopardizes the integrity of the blockchain. All right, so energy intensive and expensive. Proof of stake, which a lot of people uh, are looking to to be a more economical solution, says basically that the, the, the person who has the most uh, stake in the, you know, you, so you buy in to whatever it is in the blockchain that you're trying to, to sell, and the network runs a lottery to decide who announces the results. You still do these computations and so forth, but the network runs a lottery to decide who announces the result. And <clears throat> proof of stake systems uh, are used by um, PeerCoin and some of these other organizations which give a reward called minting rather than mining. And so your proof of stake uh, is based more on your ownership of part of the uh, blockchain, whatever it is that you're mining or trying to get at, more than your proof of work, which is uh, solving these problems, these computational problems. Nice thing about this is that it's much, much, much less expensive than trying to use proof of work. There is also uh, another form of proof of stake, which is delegated proof of stake. And with delegated proof of stake, um, the individual decides who is going to represent their particular interest. And so you combine your stakes, you make a delegation who is going to uh, announce the results of your computations. And um, so individuals with small stakes can team up with other individuals and come up with a much larger stake and then have a, uh, a bigger say and a better chance of gaining uh, rewards from having done these computations and worked on the blockchain. So these are the ways that um, computations are done and consensus is built on the blockchain. Why is this important? Well, one of the things that you have to worry about with blockchain is maintaining the integrity and the autonomy of the blockchain itself. And you can't rely on one particular organization or one particular entity to tell you that the blockchain is um, accurate and that blo new blocks should be added to the chain and so forth. So you have to um, have con this consensus building in order to get a, a more of a group opinion on whether new blocks should be added. And you have a better chance of maintaining that integrity. So the social value proposition of blockchain is many fold. And this is what makes it kind of unique is the social value that you attribute to the blockchain itself. So number one is self-sovereignty and identity. On the blockchain, you can, blockchain, you can easily maintain your identity and self-sovereignty because there are copies of the blockchain in each computer that's working on it. And so I have a full copy of the blockchain on my cell phone. And I can know from that whether or not the transactions that have been added on my behalf to the blockchain are as they should be, okay? So I can maintain my identity and as a blockchain holder, I can have self-sovereignty over this process. A trust through authentication and authorization uh, is very important. So when you have a traditional organization like banking organization or a university, who do you trust? Well, you trust the intermediary. And with the blockchain, who do you trust? Well, you trust the blockchain, okay? So putting your trust in an, a computational object is preferable, I think, and most people think, I think, uh, to putting your trust in a third party who might have a vested interest in, um, well, doing whatever that they might do uh, to your assets. 
Uh, transparency and provenance. Um, you know the origins of your transactions because they're all stored on the blockchain. You know, nothing on the blockchain can be destroyed. You can have new transactions that reverse previous transactions, but the previous transactions are still there and you can see them. So if somebody tries to make a change to a blockchain in error or um, with some devious intent, you can at least see that this has happened. And in fact, through the consensus building process, usually that is not allowed to happen because a consensus would not allow uh, an errant entry to be added to the blockchain. Uh, the blockchain is immutable. Once you create it, it doesn't change, you can't destroy it, it's, it's there. And disintermediation, that is there's no third party involved with blockchain. It's just the blockchain and participants in the blockchain. So this is kind of the social value proposition that goes along with a blockchain. And um, whether or not you believe in all this is the degree to which you might buy in to this technology. So how can we use this stuff in education? Well, you know SNU is going through a lot of changes with um, competency-based education, modularization, micro-certifications, uh, you name it, uh, we're doing it, or we're trying to do it. And um, this brings problems with student information systems and other ways of recording all this stuff and keeping track of all this. Also, you know that sometimes these things can be forged. How many people have seen a CV or a resume that it is totally unrepresentative of what a person actually is capable of doing or what they've done? Fake PhDs, fake certifications, you name it, it's all over the place. With something like a blockchain or block certs, which is what um, MIT and others are uh, in Learning Machine are using, um, you can avoid that by putting all of this information on the blockchain as transactions from micro certifications to courses to degrees to whatever it is you want to put on the blockchain. You can do that with smart contracts if you want as well as using blockchain uh, in its, in its uh, raw form. Uh, there are vendors like Learning Machines, GradBase, Stampery. There are lots of vendors out there that are starting to use this approach, and there are more every day. There's some 20 now, probably more uh, every day. So uh, you might want to store an e-portfolio as opposed to certifications. So it's very important for students to demonstrate what they can do and so forth to have an e-portfolio that people can look at, but that they can hold privately. So if you give permission or you give a hash, for example, to an employer that says, this will allow you to look at my e-portfolio, you can have a good deal of privacy and personal ownership of the e-portfolio, but yet still give a view to that, a view of that to somebody that uh, will help you get a job or help you get a go to grad school or whatever. Uh, managing intellectual property, this has been pr proposed as well on the blockchain. Um, you name it, uh, from real estate titles to uh, patents to copyrights to music ownership to all sorts of things are proposed for this. And Binded, Ledger, Ledger, uh, Ledger Journal, and Bernstein Technologies uh, for copyrights and patents have been around for a while, a couple of years, and uh, they're using blockchain technologies in order to try and capitalize on keeping track of intellectual property. Um, university of Nicosia is uh, one case of a university that's using, uh, in Cyprus, that's using a, uh, a blockchain to look at their certificates. So let me go to this one first. This gives you the instructions on how to access certificates that they've issued. Um, and it tells you how they came up with the hashes using SHA-256. And then on the previous slide, you see the list of hashes. And what you're supposed to do basically is find the hash that corresponds to the certificate you're looking for 
and this gives you the index into the blockchain. And this is how they're storing and issuing certificates uh, right now. So it's a pilot in certain ways, but uh, it's uh, becoming more well established as they go forward. So this has been going on for, uh, I suppose a year, year and a half, something like that. So uh, there are lots of scenarios in higher education for using blockchain technology. Uh, one is to permanently secure certificates, certifications. Uh, that's a pretty straightforward one. Uh, Multi-step accreditation it works the other way from accreditation uh, agencies who can check up on what you're doing, what kinds of course uh, um, outcomes that you have and keep all this on blockchain uh, as a permanent record so that when they come around for reaccreditation, they, uh, they have a permanent record of what you did last time and whether you're keeping up with what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, automatic recognition and transfer of credits. So if everybody stored their credits on a blockchain or their certifications, it would be very easy to transfer from one institution to another. You might even take courses from anywhere in the world have a home institution that's going to award your certificate or degree, and if everyone is recording this information on the blockchain, it's a very simple matter, matter to validate and then issue a, a degree certificate as well. Um, lifelong learning passports, uh, tracking intellectual property, receiving payments from students, using Bitcoin and other things, uh, other mechanisms, uh, and actually giving student financial aid by using crypt uh, cryptocurrencies. Why not? Um, so there are a number of uh, scenarios that we've identified that uh, actually these came out of a report from the EU, um, a rather large one. I have a link to it on the last page of this presentation that you're welcome to take a look at. It's very informative as far as blockchain and education. Um, the study that they came out with recommendations that Way, the way we might go forward as, uh, as an institution in looking at the use of blockchain is to support an, an initiative for open educational records. This is kind of the first step. If you have open educational records that are stored on the blockchain, uh, that's the first step to facilitating this kind of worldwide use of blockchain to store all of the certifications and credits and certificates and so forth. Um, we need to continue to work on defining applications for blockchain and education. There are a bunch of them out there, but there are always more. Um, this is a very interesting technology. It's interesting in its simplicity as well. So you can think of lots of things you can do with blockchain. Uh, supporting metadata stand standards for educational records so that the meaning of the certificates that are, end up on the blockchain is not lost. Uh, so, supporting metadata standards. Um, we need to educate policymakers on what blockchain is and how to use it. And uh, that's a tough job, but we have to try. And encourage self sovereignty as a, as a form of di a key digital competency. So, educating students on self sovereignty and how to maintain it perhaps using blockchain technology and examples from there. And then, of course, as an academic, I have to say we always need more research and more research funding and all that kind of good stuff. So these are kind of the, the way forward that we think uh, might exist for the blockchain uh, in education. So uh, that was quick, but any questions on what I've said? I said a, a lot of stuff, I covered a lot of ground, and uh, hopefully we can uh, so to help have some kind of a discussion. Oh, okay. Any questions? Yeah, actually, I have um, This is actually a microphone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, for putting your, pro your records out on blockchain, what, I've been studying the blockchain for a couple months now, pretty intensely. One of the things I've noticed is the private key. So you have to have the private key to access your records. Now, I've been in IT for a while. I know the way users are. This isn't like a password that somebody forgets or loses. 
they can have reset. What are your thoughts about that, about people actually managing their own private key? This is an issue, no doubt. Um, I think that um, since the gravity of losing your private key is rather severe, I mean, you could, if you lost your private key permanently, lose everything that's on the blockchain that belongs to you um, because you'd have no way of identifying what's yours and what isn't yours. So I think probably a private key management scheme that allows people to retrieve their private keys, which really doesn't exist right now, um, uh, would be a, a great idea and probably necessity if we were to go this way for educational records. Then what, what caught my eye uh, about the private key was seeing some of these companies putting medical records out there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I spent 10 years in the medical industry, and I'm like, oh my God, can you imagine this? If somebody loses their private key, how, how do they... How do they get access to their records? How does their doctor get access to their records? Yeah, they wouldn't know whether they were sick or well. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's an issue. And so I always thought there was a layer there in managing that. But then, you know, if you talk to some of these people with well being black digital technology, it is very in a decentralized mindset. That's why New Hampshire is such a great thing because I guess there's a lot of libertarians here. So they like the decentralization. <laughs> 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 and, um, <laughs> yeah, I, it, there's no doubt that, that uh, there's a missing layer there. But, of course, the farther you go into this missing layer, the less decentralized the blockchain becomes. And it defeats some of the purpose of the way the blockchain is structured. So perhaps there is a scheme for regenerating private keys. I don't know how you do this. I didn't think about that. Regenerating private keys from the blockchain. Maybe you have a... I don't know, how would you do that? Maybe a, a rehash of every transaction that you've put on the blockchain that somehow generates back your private key. Right. I mean, it's, you know. I don't know, the it, ma mathematics would be Believe staggering. me, I've been thinking about this. Because yeah. it, it affects not just, you know, your technology, but it affects all yeah, sorts Yeah, you bet. Of sure. Absolutely. So I have a question, too. Sure. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, if um, you pursued one of these credentialing blockchain uh, approaches that you were talking about, would um, all universities essentially have to participate in creating it? Would there be one? Or would you have uh, you know, maybe different blockchains for different institutions and atomic swap between them or something like that to, to uh, uh, transfer credits or whatever the use case is? Well, I mean, the ideal solution in a perfect world would be there would be one blockchain that covered everything. But practically, that's probably not going to happen. There are proprietary interests. There are all sorts of competing um, reasons why people might not want to participate in a kind of a universal blockchain. Plus, once it gets that large, you start to think about unwieldiness. Uh, and uh, you think about having a blockchain that, uh, that is even in ASCII text form is huge. Um, but, uh, you know, right now there's the concept of a public blockchain and a private blockchain. And certainly you could have private blockchains that would um, belong to each institution where they kept their credentials according to a well-established public standard and then an interface between the blockchains. You might come up with something called an interface block whose purpose it was just to interface all of these um, private blockchains with the public blockchain. I'll, I'll, I'll tack on to that. Sorry, I was hyper trading last week. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Talking about this very topic. But there's tools that are coming out uh, Nascent, but there's tools that are essentially coming out that sort of tackle some of that issue. Um, and, and, you know, we didn't get into it, but a private blockchain works radically different than what he just explained. It's, it's a different concept. You, you favor privacy versus anonymity, for example. So, um, you know, that's probably a, a good approach. And then you sort of uh, hyperedger in the cult quilt, <laughs> the kind of 
meshes these things together so that's one possible way to do that because the problem with what you're contemplating the other issues scale right you get so big that it, it almost like it doesn't work it, it's just there's too much uh, overhead in terms of computational power to actually make something like that happen so i think like y you create like this n plus one problem uh, in essence so anyway but there there are things in the private blockchain that could address some of the questions that you have that's well, we have, a, you know, we have over 100,000 students now. And, uh, you know, there are institutions that have more students than we do. Plus, you have all the historic uh, transactions and certificates and certifications and classes and so forth. And it does start to become unwieldy after a while. So uh, separating the blockchain into public and private uh, is probably the only way it's actually going to be considered. So he, his previous question, I think in the beginning, he was asking, he, he framed it in such a way, but I think he was asking about adoption of getting universities to actually adopt us so everybody's putting their records in there. And what are your thoughts around that? I know a lot of these companies today try to incentivize their tokens and then you start trading them and things of that nature. It's a crazy thing. Um, what, do you, what do you feel about getting these companies or these uh, universities? Well, I, I think there's a leadership issue and uh, once the um, public standards for blockchains start becoming working groups for IEEE and, and for ACM and these other organizations that are out there, ISO, um, that you start to get a lot more buy-in when it starts to take off and grow. And so I think the way you find public adoption like that for these kinds of institutions, public and private, usually not-for-profits, um, is by this altruistic contributions to uh, public and open standards. So I think that's probably the best approach to try and get things like this rolling. I don't know if incentivizing universities is going to do much. Um, you might, you know, you might have some leadership in National Science Foundation that starts looking at grants to start this kind of action going, but it would have to be grassroots eventually. And, might have a little bit of a seed, but eventually you're going to have to, it's going to have to take off on its own. Hi, I, I would like to ask about what do you think about term cryptocurrency and, and how blockchain connected to cryptography because you said that hashing in the block is not exactly a cryptography because it's one way. So is there anything cryptographic on it or is it? In blockchain. Um, from, from my perspective, it's really not cryptography per se, it's, it's just hashing. And um, the, the good thing about that is the fact that you can't go backwards and discover uh, the details of where the transaction, uh, the details of a transaction, only where it came from and where it went. That's all that you're really entitled to as a member of the public. So it helps with the privacy issue. Um, you can certainly um, encrypt anything that goes on the blockchain, uh, transactions, for example, within the blockchain using the hash just to identify the transaction, but encrypting the actual data. So there's a role for cryptography in blockchain, I think. <laughs> I'll just add to that. Are you familiar with the homomorphic encryption? You should look at it because um, there are um, new blockchains that essentially come out that allow you to do computations on encrypted data without ever actually seeing the data. I'm just going to plant the seed, go do some research. It's very fascinating. <laughs> but look up homomorphic encryption. All right. Um, I'm going to do something or ask something that's kind of off the wall crazy. Because I think that blockchain and um, credentialing makes a lot of sense. I think that's you know what makes sense. I'm thinking about taking it a step further. Um, what, it, like, is there any potential use in, um, say, like for plagiarism and making sure that um, the work that's created is of the student and who the student says. You know, as we're moving to this online environment, you know, we kind of have this world of anonymity, and I see that blockchain potentially being one avenue of a solution to making sure that 
um, the transaction of submitting work um, is actually going from the person that it says that it is to you know the the university and so on and so forth. Like I can see that you could actually take this down into even you know uh, more incremental steps in the education process. So um, yeah, turn it in with blockchain. Um, why not? You know, what you could do is you could come up with a, a similarity index like Turnitin has now, and you could assign a hash to that and put it on the blockchain. And then forever, this particular piece of work would be intellectual property that's owned by whoever submitted it initially. And there'd have to be algorithms or way of examining this work to determine how close a match it is. So you'd actually have to have you'd have to have some way of comparing the actual data, not just the, the hash of the transaction that stored the data, but the actual data itself, you'd have to have some way of comparing that to everybody else's. Well, what about even um, like in, in the metadata of the file that they're submitting to the university, knowing that it's coming from like one assigned someone writing a completely original paper, having that sent to them and then, you know what I'm saying? Like, sure. Kind of, well, they're kind of doing that now with Google. Right? Yeah. It goes back to the company right down here, LBRY. Mm -hmm. Doing it with music. You know, I think there, there are some creative solutions to that. You could... For example, you could uh, figure out some kind of an algorithm that, uh, that utilized the reference list and made some kind of a comparison of what this paper should represent in terms of the references that it has on it and come up with some way of comparing without actually revealing the internal, uh, the, the material of the paper itself come up with some kind of an encryption scheme or an encoding scheme that would, um, that would characterize the paper without actually having the paper itself or the intellectual property. I don't know how you'd do that, but it would be interesting to try. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have time for about one more question, then maybe we can break for a little networking. Going once, going twice, okay. Uh, I'd like to say thanks to Scott. Thank you, Scott. For coming thanks, in. my pleasure. I think we got a little bit of time for uh, informal networking. So thank you all for coming.